Good morning, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Graceland Baskren. I'm the Research Director for Energy Security and Climate Change here at CSIS. The U.S. is in an unprecedented race to secure the critical minerals that we need for national energy and economic security. China has had a strategic monopoly on the sector for decades as a result of aggressive industrial policy, both domestically and internationally. As the U.S. races to secure these critical minerals, a whole of government approach is needed. There's no debate that critical minerals is bipartisan. President Donald Trump issued the first executive order followed by President Biden, and there's been a proliferation of efforts from various government departments over the years. However, the US does not have the resources to mine what we need domestically. A senator once asked me why we don't mine what we have here first. The reason is that we wouldn't be able to construct a full electric vehicle battery. And as a result, we are engaging with international cooperation in a way that we haven't before. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Brian Minnell, CEO and Chairman of TechMet, a mining company operating in a number of countries around the world and which the U.S. government, through the Development Finance Corporation, has an equity stake in. Thanks for joining us, Brian. Thanks, Graceland. Great to be here. Brian, I want to cut to my first question. One of the big challenges that we have as a U.S. is that we, as a government, don't necessarily invest the same way that the Chinese government and that the Saudi has. We can't command the attention of the private sector to do something. The best thing that we as a U.S. government to, can do is to create a conducive environment for the private sector to be able to, to enter these markets. Um, how do we pursue creating that enabling environment? What does it take? What does it look like? Um, firstly, there's been massive progress in Washington and across the US with respect to analysis and understanding of the role and importance of critical minerals, both from a energy transition and climate change mitigation point of view, and maybe even more importantly, from an industrial competitiveness and growth and jobs point of view, vis-a-vis -vis China and Europe and the rest of the world. And that's what makes it a unassailably bipartisan issue. What needs to be done by US government, and it's an area in which the markets are failing us and where government does have to play a role because it's a crucial contributor to mitigating these big global systemic risks of jobs, growth, energy transition, climate change, and China. Um, so what we need is a lot more action to follow the, the analysis and the talk and the prioritization, which has grown a lot. And that has to come from a, you know, across all government agencies and private sector players. Private sector activity is pretty much at a three year low now. We know that exploration, drilling, funding, it's not really moving. And part of this is because mining prices are low right now mm -hmm. um, and companies are fairly price sensitive. I'm interested, you have a project in Brazil, it's a nickel project, and at right now nickel prices are down, what, over 40, 45% from the start of last year. There's been a huge increase of um, production coming in from Indonesia. How do we balance, you know, we know long-term demand is there, but short-term there's been kind of this mm. increase of market activity. How, do you, how does that bode for the future of nickel, which the U.S. has less than 1% of? How do we kind of counteract the fact that there's this long-term demand pressure but short-term price decline? Yeah. No, it's a really nickel and the perceptions of growth in nickel supply largely financed and controlled by the Chinese out of Indonesia is a really good case study. And, and, and we're in a, a, a present depressed market environment, which is radically adding to our medium-term challenge, both in terms of structural undersupply of nickel, together with other crucial critical minerals, um, and degree of Chinese control over global nickel supply, because while we are in the West all slowing down development programs or scrapping projects in a weak, temporarily short-term weak market environment, the Chinese are not. You know, they continue to accelerate investment programs to increase their dominance over global supply three, four years out, when the extent of this global supply shortage is going to be that much greater as a result of the present temporary weakness in the market. And that temporary weakness in the case of nickel is a factor of macro um, elements of the equation that are common to all markets, but specifically in nickel, a product of the overhyped um, Chinese-led investment in growing Indonesian nickel laterite production. And that is not as scalable as has been made out. Um, and it will not, even in its 
fullest extent if everything that they say is happening happens will not cover uh, the bulk of the structural short supply three, four years out. So we are allowing the markets to do us a massive disservice at the moment as in terms of U.S. interests. What should the U.S. be doing to help counter that? I mean, you kind of, you know, I was thinking recently we, the U.S. opened and closed its only cobalt mine last year because prices dropped below $15 a pound. Um, but the Chinese are continuing to build their cobalt production abroad. We have a return, Western companies have a return to our shareholders. So what does the U.S. government do to kind of reduce the cost of doing business in an otherwise very expensive and very high-risk environment? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's crucial that U.S. government balances that market failure, and they have to do that by de-risking and dropping the cost of capital of projects, both domestically and globally. So it's up to the agencies that have the mandates to engage in the space, like the DFC, who are shareholders of ours and have been enormously valuable and supportive to TechMet's program, and Exim and DOE and DOD and others, to accelerate the deployment of capital and risk mitigating regulatory engagement in order to ensure that projects in alignment with US critical mineral supply chain security are built. Because at the moment they're not being built. I would love to unpack a little bit more about the DFC. I mean, there are, there's so much interest in the DFC equity stake in TechMet. Um, you're the only mining company that the DFC has that equity stake in. Can you tell me a little bit more about how that equity kind of investment originally started? Um, and then, but also why equity should be a tool that the DFC should use. And if it's over, say, debt, which we've seen with the project in Mozambique um, and other kind of instruments that it leverages. Yeah. Firstly, the DFC should do everything the DFC does. Equity is an important tool in their toolbox, but they will continue to be predominantly a project debt provider, which is also enormously important. And in addition to the equity that DFC has invested in TechMet, we're also busy with them at the project level um, debt front as well. Um, why they? I mean, why is equity important? In the case of TechMet, their equity in their first round of equity investment in 2020 was followed by further following on equity in 22 and 23. And that has been an enormously important accelerant and de-risker for TechMet in the eyes of other equity funders. So it's allowed us to raise a lot more money from other parties to accelerate our program across what is now 10 operating companies in Africa, South America, North America, and Europe. With the DFC reauthorization coming up, what are there any changes that you would say um, should be included to ensure that really the DFC is fit for purpose for the challenges that we need of financing mining projects? I think, you know, there are elements of their mandate that should be revised and adjusted in order for DFC to be better fit for purpose, with, particularly with respect to equity and how that's treated from a budgeting and subsidy point of view. Um, they should generally be, you know, I'm not an expert on U.S. regulatory environments or how U.S government agencies are, are mandated and managed, but they do need to be supported and encouraged to take risk. You know, all of these projects have risk, as do all projects in the world, but particularly in mining and metal processing in emerging markets, which is DFC's ambit. And therefore, agencies need to be less risk averse in order to deploy more effective, bigger, bigger checks and move the dial more with respect to adequate supply of critical minerals to U.S. industry, with respect to climate change with respect to balancing China's overwhelmingly dominant global position, all of which are absolutely crucial for the United States. And what non-financing instruments should we use? Because we, when we talk about de-risking, we obviously talk a lot about you know financial de-risking, but there's more than that, given the jurisdictions that we want to go to are often ones that the U.S. and Western companies have not had commercial engagements with. They're often ones where there's very minimal presence, even potentially from an embassy point of view, what non-financial tools should we be looking at? Yeah, I mean, the U.S., given the crucial role that critical mineral supply chain security plays for so many important elements of U.S. success, growth, jobs, national security, 
it, it justifies the deployment of the full range of tools and weapons available to the United States. You know, how the United States engages in countries like the Congo or Chile or Argentina um, in order to balance China's overwhelmingly dominant position, having been given a free reign over 15 years to build their controlling roles while everybody was sleeping, um, is multifaceted. You know, the U.S. is the biggest and richest and most powerful country in the world. They may have government institutions that are less easily fit for purpose than Chinese government institutions, and democracy is an enormous strength, but also an encumbrance, but we need to use its strengths and not try and out Chinese the Chinese, which we're never going to be able to do. Um, but the U.S. has military, it has cyber, it has intelligence, it has a lot of soft power, both hard power and soft power, and has a lot of carrots and a lot of sticks. And those carrots and sticks need to be deployed aggressively and imaginatively and urgently. And they're starting to be because this is raise, you know, rising radically in the list of priorities of U.S. government, but it's still got a long way to go. Now, do you think that having the DFC equity stake, right, having a kind of a government equity stake, does it actually make it easier to go in and do business in some of these countries and to, I mean, your, your projects in Rwanda, South Africa, Brazil, is it easier when you go in to engage with a government to have kind of that DFC U.S. government seal? Yeah, it is. It's universally perceived as positive in terms of a credentializer and de-risker. Everybody, all the producing countries want U.S. engagement to balance China's dominant position. And, and obviously at the consumer end, be it the automakers or others, everybody wants an alternative to reliance on Chinese controlled supply chains. So, you know, the DFC participation or substantial shareholding in TechMed is, is enormously positive for us. And has it been easier compared to before you had this equity, you've lived longer than this equity investment. Has it been easier to get other investors to crowd in once you have that DFC equity stake? And then is it, um, we, before you got the equity stake, can you tell me a little bit about how um, was it easy to find investors? Because mm -hmm. I know that there's other big mining operations that actually ended up in the US ultimately turning to Chinese financing in the mm -hmm. late 2010s because they were unable to mobilize US-based financing. Yeah. It, it's, it hasn't been easy. It's got easier as the recognition of the critical mineral supply demand dislocation has grown. It's got somewhat more difficult over the last year and a half as markets have you know, moved into a fairly depressed state. Um, for us, it's much easier than for others, and part of why it's easier for others, apart from our diversity and our track record and our capacity to continue to scale our projects and add new projects, is the U.S. government participation. I mean, we have the unusual distinction of being the only metals and mining company ever in history to have direct U.S. government equity investment. Um, and that is a massive enhancer of our status, our access, our positioning, and hence our ability to, as a force multiplier from a funding point of view and a project development and an engagement with global, you know, the global industry point of view. And it was really a, a quite a world platform moment last year at COP28 when, you know, we, we announced we were going to triple renewable energy capacity globally, but we didn't really back that with the clear critical minerals announcement. However, obviously, the TechMet announcement with the DFC kind of became the, the one big critical minerals announcement out of that. So to be, I mean, it has become quite a staple of the dialogue internationally and how the U.S. is engaging has been through mm -hmm. that TechMet vehicle. Now, I want to ask you another question. I mean, when we talk about mining jurisdictions abroad. Mining, my, you and I both know mines quite well. They're not always located in the most attractive places, and they're often located mm -hmm. in places that are hard politically, economically, and socially. There's a lot of risk tucked into that. What are the jurisdictions? How should we be looking at the jurisdictions that we should be prioritizing mm -hmm. our engagement as the U.S. with? Yeah. I think, I mean, as TechNet, we go to jurisdictions where we're confident we can ensure high ESG standards and transparency and good governance, which is part of our commitment to DFC and part of our DNA and what we have sought to be at the forefront of our industry um, with respect to from inception. Um, so that's a big driver for us. Um, however, from a US interest point of view, um, the jurisdictions, one can't be too fussy about jurisdictions. You know, the Congo is the dominant supplier of cobalt and will remain the dominant supplier of cobalt to the global markets for the coming years. 
and therefore the Congo is an environment in which the industry and U.S. government has to engage in in order to ensure security of supply of cobalt to U.S. industry or the supply chains feeding U.S. industry. And therefore what we have to do as well, what the U.S. government should contribute to doing is ensure or help to ensure that environment is one in which we would be happy to invest. We as TechMed have not thus far invested in the Congo for the reasons of concern with respect to ESG standards and transparency. Not really risk. We're prepared to take risk. We just want to make sure that we uphold high standards of governance. Um, but there's a lot the U.S. government can do to enable and support and encourage that environment to adopt a regulatory environment that is conducive to US aligned investment that is responsible and sustainable, which is what we have to do. Your work with TechMet and including with the DFC equities actually started in the previous administration and it's continued on now kind of growing. Um, there's an election coming up this year, it turns out. And in fact, no, I, I believe so. Oh my goodness. And it 49% <laughs> of the world's population is living in a country with an election this year. So things, yeah. it, it's actually a much bigger dilemma. Africa, Asia, India, UK, US. What do you think, I'm going to ask you about the US election, but even elections in a lot of the countries that we are looking at, um, with, that have existing Western mining projects, that have pipeline projects, where like, you know, we, we're working through resource nationalism. How do you feel about the U.S. election, but elections more broadly and how yeah. they may sway the agenda this year? Um, on the U.S. front, certainly as TechMet and as the whole space of critical mineral supply chain security is totally bipartisan and apolitical and pro-American. You know, we are dedicated as TechMet um, to supply well-governed U.S. aligned critical mineral supply chains to feed U.S. industry. We're at the, at the beginning of a massive global transformation in energy and in mobility. And that's going to be one of the defining characteristics of the future of the global commercial, industrial, technological landscape. And the winners, countries and companies, are going to be those that secure reliable, preferential access to critical mineral supply chains now, and the losers are going to be those that don't. And the cost of losing is very, very high, and the benefits of winning are crucial for industrial competitiveness, for jobs, for growth. Um, you know, climate change aside, you know, we're competing with China, who have a head start and are doing an extraordinarily effective job in this space, but also with the rest of the world. And therefore, and nobody across the political divide disputes the necessity to do everything we can to um, be competitive and grow and provide jobs. So I'm not concerned about U.S. politics. You know, we are pro-American and pro-growth and pro-jobs. With respect to elections elsewhere in the world, particularly in emerging markets that are rich in critical minerals, there's a very different dynamic. And election cycles tend to encourage populist resource nationalism for obvious reasons. And that can be a problematic distorter of the environments in which we need to invest and we need to build responsible projects. Because it, it, it is a tendency of populist politics in emerging markets to uh, be forced to make promises to eat the goose before it lays the golden egg because there's a perception that at control of substantial critical minerals resources is everybody's going to be the next Saudi Arabia and therefore we need to make sure that we own as much of it as possible and tax as much of it as possible and royalty as much of it as possible in order to and 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 process as much of it as possible domestically, all of which are legitimate aspirations, but a tricky balance for those aspirations not to deter investment and hence prevent the benefits of that global shift accruing to those countries. Brian, we met in Saudi, um, which is, I always say it's remarkable that, you know, Saudi's progress can be measured no greater than having 14,000 people land in, a, in, in Saudi in January where it's dry and there's no alcohol. I mean, that really shows how much interest is picked up in the Saudi approach to mining. Now, Saudi is willing to put the capital forward, right? They've got the capital ready to deploy. China has the capital to deploy. But again, the West, like, you know, the Western companies are a little bit hesitant. They owe that return to their shareholders. How do... In your experience right now, beyond TechMet, you know mining bigger, you've been in mining for many decades at this point. Do investors want to go into these projects in these emerging markets? 
Um, it's a challenge, and it's a challenge for two reasons. One, because mining and metal processing in emerging markets are long-term capital-intensive projects that have risk. Um, it's a challenge because a lot of the conventional investing institutions in the West still see mining as a PR and ESG risk that they would prefer was taken by others, even though they increasingly recognize that you can't have energy transition and climate change mitigation and industrial security without critical minerals industry transforming itself in terms of volumes and in terms of standards. But they don't, in, they, we still have a big problem going to the big institutions. So we do need players like the sovereign wealth funds in the Middle East who have the vision, see the market dislocation and value creation opportunity see the global geopolitical landscape that they can be in the middle of and get a lot of leverage out of, um, and see the benefits to the diversification of their economy of having preferential access to critical minerals to feed domestic industry. So they will be increasingly important as sources of capital because of those challenges with respect to conventional private sector capital from you know, elsewhere in the non-Chinese world. There's a little bit of um, an apprehension that's long result that's long and been in mining, but I think even clearer now with ESG. No one wants to be on the other end of the ESG. No one wants to be at the, mm. on the other end of you know Rio Tinto's cave situation where they blew up the mm. caves. No one wants to be on the other end of the child labor accusations. What mm. are you doing as TechMet in terms of ensuring the ESG is intact, that there is that transparency, because it's a really important form of oh. form of non-financial de-risking. It is, and it's increasingly not only the right thing to do, and we want to do the right thing and do it responsibly and sustainably, but a necessary thing to do from a point of view of access to capital and access to market and preferential access to market, because the OEMs and others need to have transparent and well-governed supply chains to underpin their brands when they are selling a clean energy transition consumer product like an electric vehicle. So it's really important. I mean, what we do, and, and it's a misperception that mining and metal processing cannot be low environmental impact and well-governed and constructive with respect to social and political interface and low carbon footprint, and it has to be. And this is part of how our industry needs to transform itself and how the tech med element of the Western industry needs to differentiate itself from the Chinese financed industry, which has less rigorous standards than we impose on ourselves. So we are very, very conscientious across all of our projects to do things well. So that responsible mining is kind of heart of the, the mineral security partnership and these kind of efforts to like kind of lead by example in this way. But one of the flagship kind of U.S. vehicles um, for critical mineral security is our Inflation Reduction Act. Right. And to get those benefits, your minerals have to be mined or and processed in, a, in the U.S. or a free trade area country. Brazil is not a country that ha we have an FTA with, and it's not a country that we have a critical minerals agreement with. Should we be looking at these instruments, you know, uh, extending these instruments or widening the inclusion of countries in these instruments? I think we should, either to widen the inclusion to include countries like Brazil, which are potentially a very, very important part of U.S. critical mineral supply chains. Um, or to somehow um, create the regulatory ability to designate projects um, to be compliant if they meet the right standards in terms of ownership and transparency and ESG. Um, so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that front. And the RA is a very a massively important piece of legislation, how the extent to which it moves the dial and does what it has the potential to do is obviously dependent on that regulatory implementation. Um, and some of that has been defined and some of it will be defined as it evolves. But it's extremely important both to encourage what things like we're doing in Brazil on nickel cobalt um, or make it easier and make it more financeable, um, but also to discourage what reliance on countries like Indonesia Mm -hmm. which are always going to be, or always is a big word, but are a massive ESG and carbon footprint issue and a massive Chinese control issue. So I'm going to ask you a hypothetical situation now. So we're, we can take a project that you already have. What other government support instruments, right, would help make your 
increase the likelihood of success of your project. Obviously, we've got the mm -hmm. equity, but what else? Because when we think of a whole of government approach to go in and ensure that a project is successful abroad, because the US is now building mm -hmm. processing facilities. We're building the rare earth. You've got a recovery project in South Africa. We've got, we're building our separation facilities. We're building mm -hmm. the graphite you know, processing. Yeah. We're building this, but we need feedstock. And we, mm -hmm. you can process anywhere, but you can't get your feedstock anywhere. Yeah. So what? What would be maybe three three areas of support that the government could provide to a private, you know, sector company to maximize mm. chance of success? Yeah, if you take our Piawi Brazilian nickel project, which is a good example, we have financed and built the first commercial unit. We've been in continual production for eighteen months, and we're busy securing a one point two billion dollar funding package for the large scale expansion of that project to be one of the lowest cost and certainly one of the lowest carbon footprint producers of nickel and cobalt hydroxide to feed um, battery metal supply chains. Um, and, and we're getting a lot of support for that. We've got DFC equity through TechMed. We're busy with um, looking at debt at the project level. Um, what, what more could we get? We could get more engagement from a normalization of Brazil's status under RRA. Mm -hmm which is not a requirement for us because the processing of our product will probably go through free trade countries. Um, but nonetheless, it would be a positive. We need an acceleration of diplomatic support at the G to G level in order to ensure that we're well looked after and protected in Brazil, which there's been some of, but it's an ongoing process that is very important to us. We need support from a point of view of the rest of our funding structure, which includes, for instance, U.S. automakers, who are naturally reticent with respect to engaging and taking risk in battery metal supply chains because they've never done it before, um, and need encouragement and support from government so that they know that risk is being mitigated and they are encouraged to act in a manner that's in the national interest. And I know that's a tricky area from a U.S. system and democracy point of view. But it's important that we're not squeamish. You know, the U.S. automakers, I'm not saying they should be compelled to invest in mining projects in order to secure preferential access to product to feed their EV programs. But they do need to be helped. And government soft help in terms of engagement and dialogue in order to draw them into a national strategic agenda and make them feel like Washington is looking out for them is very positive. It's a really hard line. I'm from Detroit, so I have the auto industry holds a big soft spot in my heart. And I think one of the things is that with these auto manufacturers, you know, we they, we keep talking about paying the premium for responsibly sourced minerals and metals. But even in the current state, without that premium, they're completely they're not competitive with China. Right. We know Elon Musk came out and said, basically, they're not going to stay afloat without, you know, government mm -hmm. support. But these legacy auto manufacturers have a bigger challenge of not already being co commercially cost competitive and now putting on these premiums. Should the government be kind of covering that responsible premium support? Where does that fall? Well, to an extent, by participating in the political risk insurance and the funding structures, they are doing that. If the DFC lends money to projects at preferential rates relative to private sector sources of debt, if Exim engages with projects which increasingly they have the ability and hopefully will increasingly have the ability to do, if the DOE can be a little bit more flexible with respect to how their loan program and grant programs support supply chains beyond simply US projects, and that is effectively subsidizing the supply chains of responsibly sourced and non-Chinese controlled critical minerals or battery metals for, for US automakers. So it doesn't have to be grants to make the nickel hydroxide, you know, lithium hydroxide or nickel sulfate feeding the Altium GM LG battery manufacturing partnership more cheaply than they would be fed by simply continuing to get supply through Chinese controlled supply chains. Um, it's much more diverse than that, but it, it's happening and IRA is part of it happening. 
Absolutely. Commodity prices falling is a relatively new phenomenon. I mean, it's the last couple of years, right? I think it was the start of 2022 that JP Morgan said, you know, we're, we're at the start of a commodity super cycle and all of the mining companies were grinning ear to ear because that's high prices for 10 years, right? But within six months, it became evident that that, uh, that, that prediction was incorrect. Do you, yeah. I mean, what do you see as being kind of the, the next five years? Do we see our price? I mean, the, the mining market for as long as we've known it, boom and bust and boom and bust. Mm -hmm. The bust is just at an inconvenient time right now. It, it is. It is because it's adding enormously to the medium term short supply and it's adding enormously to Chinese overwhelmingly control, control over critical mineral supply chains globally. Um, so it's a very inconvenient time. It's also a time of enormously compelling opportunity for countries like TechMed, um, who provided we can continue to finance, can create an enormous amount of value mm -hmm. by investing aggressively in a weak market before what will be a 10-year bull run that is inescapable and unavoidable, particularly as a result of the increase in medium-term structural short supply as a result of short-term market weakness. So it's, it's, a, it's a problem and an opportunity, but it is one that we have to remedy. And, and it came about as a result, you know, as I mentioned, to an extent Chinese manipulation of markets in order to continue or per perpetuate dominant positions um, as a result of factors outside of the critical minerals world, which is just the world's weaning itself off um, plentiful cheap liquidity, which it had become drunk on over the last decade up until a couple of years ago, and high inflation and higher interest rates, which will persist for a period of time. Um, and it's a product of the fact that we had a speculative boom in the prices for these metals two years ago, which resulted in a degree of short-term overproduction. But it's irrelevant. We're not in a cyclical market. We're in a 20-year supply-demand dislocation. There'll be volatility along the way, and there'll be overcorrect overshoots and overcorrections as we've seen but the overall outlook is unavoidably compelling these metals are going to be the ingredients of transformative elements of the global industrial infrastructure and they are in structural short supply and mines do take eight to twelve years to build and battery gigafactories take two or three years to build so they will be a mismatch and a continual sporadic undersupply for the next five ten fifteen years couple quick fast questions. What minerals are you most worried about? Um, we're worried, we're worried, you know, we're, we're concerned about all of the critical minerals that take met targets. Um, I think nickel is a massive issue. Cobalt is a massive issue. Lithium is a massive issue. Rare earths are a massive issue. Tin is a massively greater issue than people appreciate mm -hmm. because they generally don't talk about tin, which is the essential connector and solder on all electronic circuit boards. And an electric vehicle requires six or seven times the tin of a diesel or petrol engine vehicle. So, you know, there's a range of all the critical minerals feeding renewable energy systems out of which you build solar cells and wind turbines and electric motors and lithium ion batteries and vanadium redox flow batteries to be an alternative for grid scale battery storage are all at the beginning of an epic supply demand dislocation that is getting worse every day, not better, as a result of the present temporary depressed market environment. I want to ask one last question. There's this kind of, we're kind of stuck in two places here, right? Which is we want to build domestic security, production where we can, processing in particular, because we know that China, the biggest bottleneck we already really face is at the processing point. If you look at your six biggest critical minerals, China is only a top three producer for two, but they are a top yeah. three processor for all six. Um, so we want to build that c those capabilities in the U.S. wherever we can. But then you have the other side, which is in the last year particularly, you've seen a huge rise in resource nationalism, export mm -hmm. restrictions kind of coming out of places like Namibia, Ghana, Zimbabwe already mm -hmm. had one, Malaysia is designing one. You know, you, it, the mm -hmm. list is getting longer and longer, partially because countries are going, I have a lot of value under my feet and I can capture that value. So what that's starting to do is to put pressure in terms of we need to build you know, more value addition in countries. Mm -hmm. How do we, can we do both of those at the same time? And is that, is it from the private sector, is it commercially lucrative to have to do them on both ends? Um, it's a big challenge. M mineral specialty metal processing is generally lower margin than mining. 
And it's a very difficult area to build capacity in a competitive manner where you generate sustainable returns in the face of a Chinese dominance of critical minerals processing, which is almost unassailable. They've done a brilliant job of building these global supply chains and scaling them and dominating them. And they've done that with advantages we don't have, like cheap or free government money, like cheap land, cheap power, economies of scale, and, and a state which is prepared to subsidize the low margin elements of a supply chain in order to control the supply chain, which we don't have the luxury to do. So we do need a degree of vertical integration. And the idea that you can just build lithium hydroxide plants in the States because you need them and the US should have them is somewhat naive unless somebody's going to give you cheap money or free money, free land and free power, in which case, obviously, you can build it anywhere and compete and make money. So that's element of the supply chain. And, and what you say about China's control, that is a key element of their control. But their control over primary resource is a lot more than it looks superficially, because even beyond what they control in terms of outright equity, they have funding structures, offtake agreements, and arrangements that control a lot more of the primary resource in Africa and Latin America and else in the world, elsewhere in the world than you can superficially see. And there is a hesitancy now to sign those long-term offtake agreements given price volatility. So it kind of only yeah. makes our, it only deepens our challenges. Brian, I think there's very mm -hmm. few people in the world who are better suited to have this conversation. You sit at the nexus of government, you know, the government efforts, but also the private sector also working kind of across the global south, which are the markets that the U.S. is learning how to engage with for the first time. I know you're so busy. Thank you so much for your time. It has been such a pleasure to have you here. Great. Thanks, Gracelyn. And thank you so much for all the work the CSIS has been doing, which has been enormously valuable for our industry.